Well, thank you very much indeed. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here this morning. A huge thanks to uh, the Constitution Unit, the University of Oxford, and also UK Energy Europe for um, pulling this extraordinary um, event together. Um, my name is Catherine Barnard, uh, Professor of um, EU uh, Law at the University of Cambridge, and I'm delighted to be joined by a wonderfully distinguished panel who I'll very briefly introduce in a moment. And the way we're going to run this panel is as follows. Um, uh, I have an open-ended question that I will pose to the panel and they will respond to it um, as they see fit. They will each talk for about five minutes um, and then uh, there will be a brief discussion between us. And then um, the panel are very keen to hear your questions. And so please uh, put your questions in the Q&A um, Alan, as in the previous session, will kindly um, coordinate those questions and then put them to the panel uh, afterwards. So I do encourage you to participate. So um, as far as the panel is concerned, I won't give them glowing introductions. Please know that they would be glowing introductions, but frankly, I think everyone in this audience knows who um, the panel is. But very briefly, uh, in alphabetical order, Edward, Edward Fawkes QC, Lord Fawkes, um, man of many, many parts, but for these purposes, perhaps of most relevant, chaired the Independent Review of Administrative Law, which um, the Lord Chancellor spoke so warmly of um, in the last session. Um, Kate Regan um, is coming at this from also a judicial perspective, having um, served for a long time um, on the Constitutional Court um, of South Africa. She's now the director of the Bonavero Institute of Human Rights um, in Oxford. And uh, thirdly, Joshua Rosenberg, uh, the most respected of legal commentators, Joshua Rosenberg QC, indeed, I know the only um, uh, journalist to have been a appointed a QC and of course the magnificent host of Law in Action and a host of other uh, programmes and also just published a book uh, called Enemies of the People, How Judges Shape Society, um, which of course as we've just heard they should not be doing, uh, they should be for Parliament. So um, my question, which either takes the form of a terrible uh, googly or um, an undergraduate uh, exam question and I imagine there's a large number of us on this call who are having to mark uh, these things at the moment is um, if um, somebody arrived from Mars and wanted a brief introduction to the UK constitution how would you describe the UK constitution today? And so if I may, we're going to do it, I think, in um, alphabetical order. I'm not going to give you marks on how well you answer that question, because I would like you to come at it from your rather distinctive perspectives. So, um, Edward, would you like to um, kick off? Yes, thank you very much, Catherine. Thank you, um, fellow panelists, for joining me. And thank you for all who are, um, are watching and listening to this. Uh, a very difficult question, and I promised Catherine that I wouldn't mention Lord Hennessy, my uh, colleague in the Constitution Committee, who says that he's spent his entire life looking for the British Constitution. I think we can all identify the various constituent parts of it. Uh, it's often said it's an unwritten constitution, but of course large amounts of it are in fact written down. It's in a, a potential state of flux at the moment, and uh, it was interesting that the questions and uh, the observations of the Lord Chancellor were focused very much on is parliamentary sovereignty the governing principle and uh, to what extent does judicial review play an important part in moderating uh, parliamentary sovereignty. So I think I'm going to duck the big uh, question and try and address it by reference to the inquiry that we uh, carried out into uh, judicial review and how, what we thought our job was and what in broad terms were our conclusions. Uh, the, um, the task of the independent review um, of administrative law seemed to me to be essentially, well, what is wrong, if anything, with judicial review? Why was that question worth asking? Well, of course, there had been some uh, significant constitutional cases, Miller 1, Miller 2, for example, 
when the government had lost cases of very great importance in relation to the Brexit process. Uh, the governments don't like losing cases, but it is, in my view, a very healthy sign of a functioning democracy that governments do regularly lose cases. Then, of course, we had the wreath lectures from Lord Sumption, in which he described in vivid terms Law's expanding empire. And there has been a considerable amount of literature uh, generated in part by policy exchanges, judicial power project, suggesting that judges have been overreaching themselves. Now, um, the terms of reference were very specific. We were given a rather limited time in which to produce answers to some very difficult questions. However, uh, we were assisted by more than 2,000 pages of extremely learned submissions. And as the Lord Chancellor said, the panel was in fact um, uh, appointed, I think, with different a priori views about this subject. Uh, three academics, two uh, practitioners, one of which was the chair of the Administrative Law Bar Association and myself. Um, Clearly, there are certain cases about which there can be disagreement, recent cases. The Lord Chancellor mentioned Evans, the Unison decision is another one, the Jerry Adams case, which appeared to uh, moderate the Caltona principle, uh, as well as Privacy International. Uh, not to mention, of course, Miller 1 and Miller 2, where there were disagreement between academics, disagreement between judges themselves. But it seemed to us that it wasn't going to be terribly helpful for all of us to give our different views about those cases. Rather, I thought that our approach should be to stand back and look to see whether judicial re review as a whole was fit for purpose, whether the recent cases um, meant that uh, judges were generally going too far and there should be some legislative or other intervention to moderate them. And our conclusion um, in that respect was that we did not think there was anything radically awry with judicial review that it continued to serve an important constitutional purpose of indicating the rule of law, providing a check and balance uh, to the um, executive. Um, one particular point I, I would like to stress, I think in answer to the overall question is this, that the, um, the terms of reference and the, uh, the way in which we were invited to approach it rather suggested that this was a dispute between the executive and the judiciary, the context of judicial review. Uh, we thought that ignored um, or didn't pay sufficient attention to the role of Parliament. Uh, and um, the Lord Chancellor mentioned the importance of parliamentary scrutiny. Um, I would certainly endorse that. And one of our conclusions suggested that one of the difficulties um, for courts is where legislation is very broadly framed, where ministers are given not very precise powers. To some extent, that's inevitable. But the, the, the vaguer the parliamentary provision, the more understandable it is that uh, there can be a challenge by way of judicial review. What we actually said was, um, and this is one of our conclusions, it's arguable that in the past 40 years, the courts have in some cases decided to regard as justiciable certain exercises of public power um, or issues relating to those exercises that should have been regarded as non-justiciable. Um, the the gap between law and politics is a difficult one. There are inevitably going to be some cases where um, the judges appear to be invited to make political or quasi-political decisions. The terms of reference referred specifically to a court of appeal judgment, um, the case of Horro, where the, um, uh, one of the judges referred to the danger of politics by another means. Now, um, there are those who use judicial review for political purposes. Some of them even celebrate the fact. Uh, and um, we have to, I think, rely on judges to be astute to detect what is a political protest at a particular government policy and what is in fact a challenge to the legality of that. And provided the, um, the various parts of the constitution respect institutional boundaries, that should not cause a problem. Although there will inevitably be uh, moments of tension between the various parts of the constitution. That seems to me to be quite a healthy sign. Um, finally, and I know we're short of time, so I'll conclude now. What we did have no difficulty concluding was that it was perfectly legitimate for parliament to decide to reverse specific decisions 
which they thought were wrong. And judges do get things wrong from time to time, or the, the decisions they reach prove in the fullness of time, perhaps to be as less well advised than they might be, or whatever euphemism one uses. There is nothing wrong with that. Parliament, in our view, should be slow to reverse decisions, and there may be all sorts of consequences in doing so, but there is nothing wrong in their doing. So we uh, selected two particular areas where they thought that we thought there should be intervention. Um, there are others where they might decide in due course to reverse it. It doesn't look good if Parliament is always reversing decisions of the courts, but they are entitled to do so. That seems to me to be the doctrine of parliamentary sovereignty. And that still, subject to certain uh, ultimate uh, stress tests, seems to me to be the governing principle. I, um, I agree with what Tom Bingham said in the rule of law. I respect that there may be circumstances where parliamentary sovereignty uh, may appear to be um, stretched to its limit. And there could be rule of law challenges if, for example, there was a, an abolition of judicial review. But our view was that the system as a whole judicial review was working and that it meant there was a healthy constitution. Thank you very much indeed. That's um, immensely helpful. Um, can I turn now to um, uh, Kate Regan, please? Thanks, Catherine, and, and thank you to you and, and, and Meg and Alan and the other organizers for, for inviting me to participate in this panel where I feel somewhat of an outsider. And so I'm going to approach this uh, question you've set us uh, from a distance. And, and that is to say that constitutions are always in flux, uh, wherever they are. Um, we need to recognize that perhaps we can be slightly misled by the idea that once uh, rules of a constitution are written down, it gives it some permanent um, fixed character. But actually constitutions are better understood not only as the written rules or laws that, um, that are provided in a constitutional text or in statutes or in the rules of parliament or in, in other sets of rules, but also as the sets of norms and practices that build up around them. They're very often political norms, they're not legally enforceable, but it's the way in which power is distributed within the state and the way in which the relationship with, between the state and citizens is managed is fundamentally what a constitution is. And by and large, they're always in flux. So that's the first of four points I want to make. The second is to say that they're in flux for a range of reasons. Some of them are to do with patterns of political contestation. And we often think about these. We think about the way in which constitutions work, particularly in democracies, as being affected by the way in which political contestation takes place. But there are a range of other reasons as well. So there are social and economic factors uh, that affect the way in which constitutions work. And just to give you some idea of the factors that I think globally are affecting constitutions all over the world at the moment is the growth of the global economy. Uh, the need, as it were, as a result of the, uh, the emergence of the global economy and patterns of trade for us to be reliant on forms of international regulation in many ways, this impacts on how domestic constitutions work and are practiced. The changing role of the state, um, the, the role of the state in the UK, of course, has changed dramatically in the last hundred years in terms of the way in which it relates to people, the services it provides and so on. These kind of changes in the way the state work completely fundamental, completely change our constitutional practices and norms and often our rules as well. Um, another factor in the international sphere, of course, is the growing power of some private organizations. And the classic example of that are the social media platforms, which in fact are a, a platform for political conversations, as well as other forms of conversation. And that's a very, they are impacting the way in which our domestic constitutions work. And it's not surprising that democracies all over the world are thinking about how to deal with the phenomenon of the private social media platforms. Changing social attitudes are another factor. And one of those is this rather paradoxical pattern we're seeing in many parts of the world, which is at the same time as the growth of international, um, the kind of the growth of, together of the global economy and global practices, we're seeing the rise of the importance of the local to citizens everywhere. Now, the UK, my third point, is affected by these bigger patterns, just as pretty well everywhere else is. 
So we see that in, for example, the relationship between the devolved uh, parts of the United Kingdom and the centre. We see that in the current debates in the UK Parliament on online harms and how to deal with social media regulation. We see that in the contestation that the Lord Chancellor mentioned around the internal markets bill and the relationship between um, the devolved parts of the UK and the centre, and also the relationship between the UK and the rest of the world. So all of these uh, factors that I've talked about that affect constitutions are affecting the UK constitution at the moment. Now, the fourth point I want to make is really to turn to this question, which seems to be to be a theme of today, which is the relationship between legal and political accountability. Most modern liberal democracies recognize that political power should be constrained um, politically, but also that it should be constrained legally. And to me, the legal constraints on political power are normally best understood in the term the rule of law, which was such a theme of um, the Lord Chancellor's uh, address earlier. It is true, as the Lord Chancellor states, that there is debate about the precise um, concept of the rule of law, the precise, uh, its precise content. But there is, also, there is also an enormous amount of agreement about it. So we shouldn't let what may at the end of the day be peripheral disagreement on the edges of the rule of law to blind us to the uh, the consensus on its centre. And the consensus on its centre, I would say, relates firstly to the idea that power must be uh, exercised according to law. And that at the end of the day is the fundamental principle of legal accountability, that we hold power to account through courts to be acting lawfully. And that's a very central principle of the rule of law. A second principle of the rule of law is that uh, in exercising, um, in, in, that in determining cases, there should be fair process. Uh, the idea that, you know, procedural fairness, proper process is a core principle of the rule of law, which you just do not see debated. Um, so there are these core ideas of the rule of law, which I think we, we shouldn't let go of in the middle of acknowledging that there are, there is a room for debate about how far the principle stretches. And of course, that those principles, you know, go back in the UK to, to Dicey. So they're, in many ways, they were formulated for the first time here in the UK. So turning then to legal and political accountability, it is difficult, and Lord Fultz has commented upon this, in, in, in drawing a line between law and politics. And perhaps one of the reasons for that is that if at the end of the day, the rule of law is to ensure that politics acts lawfully, you can't insulate politics from the legal gaze. But there's no doubt as well that it is extremely important in a democracy for accountability to be through the political arms of government. And that's both through elections and the responsibility that is imposed upon parliament when elected to ensure that law that is adopted is clear and accessible, that the executive acts in a lawful fashion. And so this role of legal accountability is performed not only by courts in cases, but also by parliament in its scrutiny of the way in which uh, the executive functions. So law and politics are intertwined. It's, an, it's inevitable in a system that respects the rule of law that they are, and that there will be debate about exactly how those lines should be drawn seems to me to be inevitable. So returning then to your question about the UK constitution, it seems it's in flux. It seems that there's some very healthy debate about exactly how we should draw this line between law and politics and the exercise that Lord Fultz's committee that undertook with such Clarity and distinction seems to me to be a, 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 an appropriate exercise of having that the constitutional understanding of the relationship between the role of courts and role of parliament reviewed. We can't avoid flux. What we need to do is continue to, to debate it and think about it and to recognize that it's not only about small, as it were, local issues within the UK. This is part of a bigger picture. And we should see the UK in, as part of that bigger picture. Thank you. Thank you. That's, that's immensely helpful and enlightening. Can I turn now to Joshua? Uh, thank you very much indeed, um, Catherine. Um, I, I, I think the answer is not just as, as Kate O'Regan says that the uh, constitution is in a state of flux, which it certainly is, but I think it's in particularly a state of flux at the moment because of the three reviews 
uh, that Robert Buckland uh, has promised. In one case, uh, the one that Oval of Folks has conducted, uh, he's already reported, but the Lord Chancellor won't tell us what he's proposing to put into his judicial reform, re judicial review reform bill, uh, whatever it's to be called, the one that was announced in the Queen's speech. So we don't know um, how far he's going to go beyond what Edward Folks recommended. Uh, so that's the first point. Um, on the uh, review by Sir Peter Gross of the Human Rights Act, uh, we are expecting uh, that to report in the early autumn, I think, and we shall wait to see uh, what he recommends. I think he's going to be less prescriptive. I think he's going to set out a series of options and we wait to see what the government's going to do. I think Robert Buckland is vulnerable on the point that uh, it's difficult to uh, reform uh, judicial review and human rights separately in separate pieces of legislation uh, because of course they're linked. Edward Folkes was asked about this in his evidence to the Joint Committee on Human Rights uh, yesterday. He points out that unless the Human Rights Act uh, is reformed and who knows whether the government's going to do that, uh, then uh, some of the uh, uh, changes which the government is proposing to make to judicial review uh, may have less effect because uh, one will still be able to rely on the Human Rights Act. The two are very closely intertwined. It seems strange to try to reform the, the two separately. The third uh, point, which of course Robert Buckland was talking about this morning, is perhaps the most interesting of all, uh, and this is his promised um, review of the Constitutional Reform Act 2005. Um, now, if you look at section one of the Constitutional Reform Act 2005, uh, you see it's headed the rule of law, and it says, this act does not adversely affect the existing constitutional principle of the rule of law or the Lord Chancellor's existing constitutional role in relation to that principle. Uh, famously, the uh, 2005 Act does not define the rule of law, the existing constitutional principle of the rule of law, it leaves it uh, completely open. And so uh, the question in my mind is whether Robert Buckland in his uh, review of that piece of legislation is proposing to define the rule of law. Um, good luck to him if he's going to do that. Um, it took uh, Lord Bingham a great deal of thought. Uh, he summarized it by saying that all persons and authorities within the state whether public or private should be bound by and entitled to the benefit of laws publicly and prospectively promulgated and publicly administered in the courts. Seems an excellent definition to me. Um, I suppose um, the Lord Chancellor could uh, uh, ask Parliament to put that into statute. Uh, there are eight principles, um, which uh, I take uh, uh, from a speech uh, that uh, Dominic Grieve made a few years ago. Uh, the law must be accessible. Questions of liability should be resolved by the law and not discretion, uh, laws should apply equally to all, ministers should exercise their powers in good faith, the law must provide adequate protection for human rights, the state must provide a way of resolving disputes, the state should be fair, uh, the rule of law requires compliance by the state with its obligations in international law as well as national laws, picking up the point made by Jonathan Jones. I have summarized those points. So we wait to see whether the Lord Chancellor proposes to put those uh, points into law. I think he's right to say uh, that uh, the phrase rule of law can be used uh, as a way of, of conducting a political campaign or even arguing uh, for a particular purpose through the rule of, uh, through, through the effect of, of the courts. Uh, but uh, equally, I think it does have some very important principles. And the third point I want to uh, make finally um, is this review of the 2005 Act and what it may achieve. Uh, Robert Buckland is very keen, I think, to restore the role of the Lord Chancellor as a linchpin, uh, something that connects the legislature, the executive and the judiciary. Uh, he made it clear in the Queen Mary lecture that he, re he regrets the loss of that link. And uh, in his evidence to the Lord's Constitution Committee last week, he said it was legitimate to consider how it might be restored. And he said that raised three issues. Uh, the first one is, is particularly interesting. He said it raised three issues, the status of the Lord Chancellor and whether there should be a qualification for that role. Secondly, the particular responsibilities the Lord Chancellor might have vis-a-vis -vis the judiciary. And thirdly, the relationship of the Lord Chancellor and Parliament. 
he says it's unhealthy that politics and the law have uh, moved apart, they become ignorant of each other, um, and it looks to me um, as if he is trying to restore um, the sort of Lord Chancellor we had in the days of Lord Hailsham. He says it's a difficult job riding two horses, uh, you have to be quite a skilled master of both to make sure they ride in an orderly way. Uh, and I wonder whether he's hoping uh, that uh, there will be one rider for each uh, uh, member of, of, the, um, uh, of this team of horses. In other words, whether he wants to uh, restore the role of the Lord Chancellor as somebody uh, looking down from the clouds who is able to explain the judges to the politicians, who is able to explain the politicians to the judges, uh, and who is able to uh, perhaps mediate between the two uh, when this is necessary. It strikes me this is a particularly challenging and difficult role for anybody to, um, uh, to carry out. I think it worked only because of the strength of the personalities. You had to be a powerful politician and a powerful uh, lawyer, and I think you have to go back to Hailsham to find somebody in that position. Uh, but his suggestion that the uh, Lord Chancellor perhaps should uh, be a, a lawyer rather than as the Constitutional uh, Reform Act doesn't quite say uh, that the uh, Lord Chancellor should be disqualified by inexperience. Um, I, I think that's a very interesting proposal uh, and one that we may hear more of. So uh, yes, the Constitution is certainly in a state of flux. Well, thank you very much for that. But I've got a couple of questions I want to follow up and I actually want to start with Joshua, if I may. You were talking about the rule of law. What struck me was um, um, Robert Buckland's statement, very clear statement, that the rule of law is, merely a, is only a political principle, not a legal one. I wondered if you or any of the panel had a view on that. Well, it is a legal principle, as, as Lord Bingham made clear. Um, it's a legal principle that may not be clearly defined, uh, although uh, you can say that, like many legal principles, it lies within the hearts of the judges. Uh, they know it when they see it, and they know abuses when they see it. Um, and I think the, the, the argument, contrary to a lot of what Robert Buckland is saying, um, is the fact that the judges don't actually need him to protect them from abuses of judicial review. They know perfectly well when people are trying to use the courts to wage politics by another means, something which uh, the Court of Appeal, uh, two or three judges have uh, very clearly uh, uh, disagreed with uh, uh, the Lord Chancellor on. They say that uh, uh, the rule of law is not an attempt to conduct politics by another means to, to, misquote, to misquote Clausewitz. So, um, I, I, I don't think that uh, the judges particularly need him to tell them what the rule of law is. I think they understand it, and I think they know when people are trying to misuse it, and I think they know when they are trying to protect it. Thank you. I wonder, um, Edward, do you have a view on that specific issue? And also more generally, when you were, I was at your, your very final remark, uh, when you, which of course goes to the nub of the potential collision between parliamentary sovereignty and um, the role of the courts and that potential ghastly clash that if parliament were to legislate that all firstborn should be um, killed where would the courts what would the courts do and you know where do you see that ultimate tip even if the courts were to strike down such a piece of legislation would parliament ultimately still reinstate it You're on mute. Um, I hope the answer to the question um, is that it would never happen. That's what um, the senior civil servants always say when you hypothesize uh, terrible situations. But um, for example, were there to be an attempt to abolish judicial review altogether, um, which wasn't actually within our terms of reference, but we could perhaps have decided to sort of obiter that that was a good idea. I think that would have run into some real difficulties um, with rule of law. They simply would not have accepted it. And one looks back to what um, Lord Hope, for example, said in the Jackson case and uh, the observations that uh, are discussed by Lord Bingham in his book, The Rule of Law. Um, there will be judges who simply will not accept certain things. Um, I hope it doesn't get to that stage, but it could theoretically. I think the rule of law is, um, is sufficiently clear and well understood. I think um, uh, Catherine is quite right in the sense that the fact that there may be some disagreement about the edges shouldn't uh, obscure the fact that there is very significant agreement about its essential uh, ingredients. Um, 
which brings this very neatly on to the point that you were making, Kate, about um, the fact it shouldn't just be the judges policing uh, these issues, it should be uh, Parliament. And um, of course, this raises the, 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 the Peter Hennessy point about the good chaps theory of government, or to perhaps put it in a more um, uh, modern form, the notion of constitutional civility in some form. Do you think Parliament really is willing and able to live up to this, particularly in the face of a very strong executive? Are you asking me that question? Yeah. Yes, well, I, I do think it is Parliament's duty, and I think Parliament generally takes that duty seriously uh, to ensure that the executive behaves according to the law. Uh, and I, I think that there's also a strong, so that's a strong normative principle of the UK constitution. But like all of these things, it doesn't mean that there won't be moments where we fail. Human endeavours, unfortunately, are error prone because we are human. So it doesn't mean that there won't be moments when we fail. But I do think that there is a, a, a commitment to the project of the rule of law in Parliament. And I think it's a very important place for there to be that commitment. But of course, we know that that's where the, the as it were, the yin and the yang of political and legal accountability work together. So that there, there is also the requirement that or, or the, the, the uh, fail-safe, in a sense, the principle of ultra virus, which is a core principle of administrative review, is that power should not be exercised without legal authority uh, in, 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 in many senses. And that is you know, why judicial review is fundamentally a project of the rule of law. So I think there, there is that commitment in parliament, like everything else, it's not perfect, and like, it, but, but, but there are fail-safe mechanisms in the system. Well, thank you. Um... Uh, I'm just want to take this opportunity to urge our very distinguished audience to um, ask uh, questions that they would like to um, have raised with the um, with the panel. I see Alan's kind of come on online. Um, Alan, do you want to start with some of the questions? Uh, yeah, we've actually just had a couple of questions so far. So, um, Catherine, as you, as you say, we'll very much welcome uh, further questions from the audience. Um, I'll be particularly keen to take questions from those people I didn't get to uh, in the first round with uh, the Lord Chancellor uh, this morning. Let me um, start off perhaps with two questions. Um, so one is from Aileen Kavanagh, professor, of course, at uh, Trinity College Dublin, uh, who has a question which she directs particularly at uh, Lord Falks, but uh, uh, others, I'm sure, uh, are welcome to answer as well. Why, uh, she says, Lord Falks, did you say that Parliament should be slow to reverse uh, judicial decisions? And then let me also take a question from the previous session, actually, which I intended to get to, but uh, didn't manage to get to, which was from Alison Young, professor in Cambridge. Uh, <clears throat> so when asked um, uh, for examples of judicial overreach, uh, Robert Buckland mentioned the Evans case. Uh, and Alison Young said, you gave Evans and also Privacy International as your key examples of possible judicial overreach. But these are examples where, where legislation potentially undermined the checks and balances you're aiming to maintain access to courts and judicial review. Are the courts not justified in also ensuring that the rule of law is upheld by maintaining the ability of individuals to appear before a court to protect their rights. Um, and I wondered uh, what the reflections of this panel would be and whether you would agree with uh, where Robert Buckland put uh, the balance in that case. Thank you, Alan. Um, Edward, do you want to start? But I'll give then I'll turn to um, Kate and Joshua to have a chance at, to get their teeth into those questions. OK, thank you very much. Um, it's only one thing that perhaps I ought to start with. I, I, I'm a bit bewildered by this idea of judges needing protection, which the Lord Chancellor mentions quite a lot. I don't think they need protection. What they need is um, clear legislation. Uh, and um, <clears throat> Professor Kavanagh asked me why we suggested they should be slow to reverse decisions. I think what um, I mean by that is that decisions reached by courts, particularly by the Supreme Court or the Court of Appeal, would have been the result of a very great deal of argument on both sides. Um, which judges have been conscious of the interpretation of a particular statute, rule of law, decisions, and the balance that has to be struck. I think um, what I meant was I don't think government should simply, a, a, as a knee-jerk response, say, I don't like that decision, let's reverse it. I think they should think, is there any real benefit by reversing 
this particular decision? Does it have wider um, uh, ramifications rather than simply, I don't like it uh, and uh, we need to reverse it to show that, uh, that we can? I think uh, the government has to live with the fact that it will lose cases from time to time. So that's what I mean by being slow. And I think um, the second question, as I understand it, was concerned with, well, why are you fastening on these cases like Evans and, and uh, Unison for possible um, criticism? Um, they are, they, in some senses, they're not um, pure judicial review cases, but they are cases in which, in fact, in the Unison case, the Supreme Court um, helped fashion or create a constitutional principle to meet the particular merits or lack of merits on that particular case. Um, I think it's an interesting decision, which is already having wide ramifications in terms of what, how do, do courts respond to this free ranging right to access to justice? It's always been a, an important principle, but uh, when you have it, as it were, um, they're floating around uh, in response to various different restraints on spending, for example, it's difficult and I think it lacks uh, clarity. Um, as to the Evans decision, well, I have to say I'd rather agree with what the Lord Chancellor said about that. That's only my view. I entirely accept there are other perfectly legitimate views. Um, thank you. Kate, do you want to add anything to that? Well, I would just like to say that I agree with Lord Fawkes' response to Aileen Kavanagh's question about being slow, and it's really about the uh, intra or inter-institutional respect, which is should exist between courts and parliament um, and that the, the process by which courts reach decisions is very, very often a very careful and thorough and detailed and reasoned process so one would expect parliament to pay attention to those reasons but having done that and so perhaps it's not slow might not be quite the right adjective maybe maybe the adjective is with, with due care and attention to the reasons given by the courts, um, then one would think that that would be appropriate in a system of parliamentary sovereignty for, um, for parliament to, to take, a, take a different view. Um, I mean, the, the one case I had thought that Robert Buckland spoke about that I think might be worth putting into the mix here, uh, in addition to those discussed by Lord Fawkes, is, is Privacy International. And really what I wanted to say about that, because that was really a case about an interpretation of a statutory provision, uh, which um, the minority thought was seeking to prevent um, uh, effectively uh, 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 oversight of by, by another court, by, by oversight by the senior courts over another court. That really is what we call an ouster court effectively in, um, uh, in, in shorthand. And they provide very difficult case law everywhere because on the one hand, uh, it is a principle of the rule of law that you determine whether power has been exercised lawfully. And if you oust the court's ability to supervise, then it is almost always a, a, a limitation on the rule of law. And yet we also recognize there are times when parliament may seek to do that, either because it's given the authority to an expert body, which it's carefully established, and it wants the decisions to be taken reasonably expeditiously and by that expert body. And whether you look at the Canadian Supreme Court's shifting views on deference to expert bodies uh, or the issues that have arisen in South Africa around these, you see these debates happening uh, all over the place. What, what I think is clear is that the, the difference between the majority and the minority reflect precisely that difficulty. And, and there are places where you can't avoid that difficulty in law and you are likely to give rise to reasoned disagreement that in fact can be said to be reasonable on both sides of the debate. Thank you. Joshua, can I give you the opportunity to ask, answer that too, but also particularly, um, I, I hear what you say about judges not needing protection as such, but uh, we could look at that question about protection from a different perspective, which was of course, as your book title um, so rightly points out, when they are described as enemies of the people and pillory, the one time they didn't get protection, it seems to me, was um, when they were being savaged on the front page of the Daily Mail. That's right, and Robert Buckland uh, fully accepts that even now, as his role uh, currently is, it is his job to defend the judiciary from unwarranted attacks, uh, and he's done so on Twitter. Uh, he, he did so um, uh, at the time of the prorogation case. 
Uh, so uh, they need that sort of protection. I don't see that they should need it, but they do need that sort of protection. I fully accept that. And I think one of the reasons that he may be suggesting that the Lord Chancellor needs to be a stronger figure uh, than it was at the time when Liz Truss was responding to Miller One is her unwillingness to support the judges until she'd been told what the line was from Downing Street and waiting three days and all that sort of thing. So certainly in those circumstances, uh, when particularly the Lord Chief Justice is involved and the Lord Chief Justice finds it difficult to speak up for himself, I can see that there is a, a, an important role uh, to uh, explain the function of the judiciary and to defend the judges. Um, moving on to the, the, the other points that you mentioned, if this was a, a cheap political debate, then my answer to Edward Folkes would be cart. Uh, it's uh, his report that is recommending that, if I can use the phrase, cart should be overturned, uh, that uh, there shouldn't be um, a second bite of, of the cherry, uh, as he said to a well-known uh, Scottish nationalist MP who was asking him questions about this uh, yesterday, um, and that it shouldn't be, well, third bite of the cherry, actually. Third bite. Uh, third bite of the cherry, quite right. Um, it shouldn't be, uh, you shouldn't have another chance to uh, challenge uh, a, a decision by uh, a, a court of record, uh, which was intended um, uh, to uh, uh, have uh, the same status as the High Court when dealing with judicial review. Um, I think um, Edward Folkes makes quite a persuasive case for that. There's obviously the concern about the statistics, but he also makes a strong point uh, that there are an awful lot of challenges third bites of the cherry uh, in judicial review, trying to overturn decisions of the upper tribunal in asylum and immigration cases. Uh, and uh, even Brenda Hale uh, is pretty comfortable with the idea of overturning her decision in that case. So uh, there are circumstances in which um, it is legitimate. I'm sure Edward would stress the point that this was carefully considered by his review, carefully considered uh, by the government. Uh, and uh, therefore, uh, if the courts have gone astray, it is legitimate for Parliament to overturn a decision of the courts, but it certainly shouldn't be a, a knee-jerk reaction. Uh, we can agree on that. As far as Evans was concerned, Prince of Wales Letters case, I think Parliament was entitled to say uh, that the Attorney General should have a veto. Um, I think Dominic Grieve was entitled to use that veto. I think the courts were wrong to, inter mis to interpret it in a way uh, that took the veto away. And we've seen Parliament has nipped in to say that, uh, you know, Prince of Wales has immunity in the future. Uh, so I, I, I think that, uh, I think Parliament was entitled to do what it did in Evans and, and the courts were wrong. As far as uh, the Unison case was concerned, I draw a distinction between the primary legislation in, in, in Evans and the secondary legislation uh, implemented uh, by uh, the then uh, uh, Lord Chancellor uh, and, and in, in, in terms of trying to increase fees for employment uh, tribunals uh, from, um, uh, uh, from zero to what, 1600 pounds. Um, I think Grayling was entirely wrong on that. I think it was entirely right of the courts to say that he didn't have that power, that he was misusing the power and that uh, Parliament couldn't have intended him to use it in that way to deny people access to the courts. It's a balance um, and the courts don't always get it right, um, but I think we need to be very careful about upsetting that balance. Robert Buckland would say the courts have already upset the balance and he's trying to right it. Thank you. Um, Edward, did you want to come back on the cart point before I take a further round of questions? Uh, no, I don't think so. I, I, I banged on about that a lot before the uh, JCHR. I don't want to go over all that. If anybody is interested in what I thought, you know, I think it's available in the transcripts and it involves looking at statistics. So it isn't a very snappy response, but I think um, Joshua summarised it reasonably well. Thank you. In which case, over to you, Alan. Um, there's some more interesting questions have come in. Yes, thank you. We've had uh, lots of good questions. We do have until half past 11 in this session. So uh, uh, the, uh, I think there's probably time for uh, some more questions. So if you haven't yet put your question in, uh, do, uh, do do so. Um, <clears throat> but let me start this round um, with a couple of questions that are still kind of chewing over what Robert Buckland said, uh, that he's clearly provoked a, lo a lot of thinking. So Dominic Grieve, a former Attorney General, of course, said Robert Buckland avoided answering the question as to whether judicial power was justified by virtue of the fact that executives with a parliamentary majority can act tyrannically even when they do not have majority, a majority of the popular vote. What does the panel feel about this? And um, 
uh, uh, sorry, uh, Paul Evans, former senior uh, parliamentary clerk, asked a similar question. He said, uh, the Lord Chancellor talked about the need for better parliamentary scrutiny of legislation to help underpin the ability of the courts and parliament to maintain their proper roles. From their observation of parliamentary debate, do the panellists think the House of Commons does enough to earn and deserve the respect of the courts for its choices and decisions? Does it challenge ministers enough? And do they have any thoughts, do the panellists have any thoughts about how parliamentary scrutiny might be improved? And then a final quick question in this round, different kind of question. Uh, again, one particularly directed at Lord Fawkes, but others very welcome to answer from Chloe Hill, who says, Lord Fawkes, is there not a difference between reversing cases which Parliament thinks uh, were decided wrongly and reversing cases for which they don't like the outcome? Um, there, there are a bump of crop. Um, Ed, do you want to start with the end first, um, uh, since that's addressed to you? Um, please don't all feel obliged to answer all questions, but pick, pick the okay. bits that you feel um, most The answer to Chloe Hill's question is that I, I agree with her, and I think I probably when she put in the question, I hadn't said what I'd said in answer to the, uh, the previous question. No, I don't think it should be uh, a matter of I don't like that decision, I therefore reverse it, which is my um, the use of the possibly inaccurate word slow to reverse, I think sums up my view on that. Um, as to uh, Dominic Reed, good morning, Dominic, um, uh, the suggestion of um, the tyrannically acting, I mean, that's a slightly uh, pejorative, or wholly pejorative term. I, I think there may be a reference to uh, Lord Hailsham's famous elected dictatorship and the power of the whips with a majority. And of course, there's a majority of 80 in this particular government or 80, slightly 80 plus. Uh, that does theoretically mean that Parliament um, is unlikely to, uh, to stand in the way of a, an executive's ideas. I'm not sure that's quite true in practice. And we've already seen signs of parliamentary revolt, even in you know, the, the remote, remote or hybrid circumstances in which Parliament is currently functioning. We see, for example, disagreement about COVID restrictions. I wonder if the whips quite have the power that they used to have. Of course, there's always the argument that you've got to be a good boy, otherwise you have the whips suspended, you may never get ministerial promotion or the like. I don't think that, that parliamentarians are as supine as they are sometimes described. But of course, Dominic's absolutely right with his huge experience that there is a danger that parliament can uh, wave things through without uh, sufficient scrutiny. I welcome pre-legislative scrutiny, particularly on difficult areas, like for example, um, Kate O'Regan mentioned the online harms or online safety bill as it's now called. Very important that that should be properly scrutinized so that there's the most uh, parliamentary involvement. Judges have actually said, the more that parliament has clearly been involved in legislation, the more likely we are to defer to parliamentary sovereignty. Now that means proper debate. I'm afraid to say that my experience of the House of Commons, and this is partly because of time constraints, is that sometimes amendments or potential amendments are not properly debated. Now, one uh, small cry for the House of Lords, much maligned, of course, uh, actually, I think one of the aspects they do very well is either by their committees or by um, looking at legislation on what's known as line by line basis. They do provide proper scrutiny uh, things are sent back to the House of Commons. Of course, the ping pong process means that they are uh, um, often reversed, but quite often ministers accept concessions, make concessions, accept amendments, so that the, the process of scrutiny does work. But of course, more scrutiny and fewer bills, which are framework bills, makes better law, less scope for the conflict, the potential conflict that can exist between the, uh, the parliament and the courts. Thank you for that. Um, can I just press you slightly on, on that issue? Um, uh, because one of the questions that was asked was, how do you improve the quality of parliamentary scrutiny? I think we can all agree that in an ideal world, that would be great. But often there's a chronic shortage of time and the, and the, the bill, the act I have particularly in mind, of course, is the EU Future Relations Act, which gave effect to 1600 pages of uh, trade and cooperation agreement um, uh, which even nerds like me haven't got to the end of by the 30th of December. Um, 
and I'd be surprised if that many MPs had spent time poring over the details. And of course, the Act itself is complicated, particularly in Section 29. Now, you might say that's an exceptional, exceptional circumstance because of the timing, but um, how would you improve on parliamentary scrutiny? Uh, very big question. I don't think that uh, when constitutional historians and um, lawyers are looking back on Brexit uh, and Parliament response to Brexit, they will consider it as Parliament's finest hour. Um, and as you say, it's completely impossible to scrutinise legislation of that sort. The time constraints were such that it was practically impossible, I think. I mean, I think the committee um, system uh, can really provide some significant support for parliamentary scrutiny. The status of their reports is, is I think, considerable. Um, I defer to experts in House of Commons procedure as to how that could be improved. I mean, Dominic Coe could probably have some good ideas about that. I noticed the fact that the Speaker can simply select amendments means that quite often really serious pieces of uh, scrutiny are, as it were, brushed aside. It's somewhat haphazard. The House of Lords, at least every amendment can be debated. Um, but, you know, there are time constraints. Um, so I, I don't think I've got any magic bullet. Thank you for that. Um, Kate? Um, yes, thank you very much, Catherine. So, of course, the, uh, the reason that Dominic Greaves gives is perhaps one of the most uh, cogent reasons for forms of constitutional uh, uh, democracy where courts are given the powers to um, to, to uh, review legislation on the basis of the, its compliance with a set of constitutional principles and you know, very ably articulated by the American uh, theorist uh, John Hart Ely, which was really to say that the most vulnerable in our society, the most marginalized, the people who effectively are not likely to form the part of the group who make parliamentary majorities are often most at risk. So uh, that, that is you know, well known in constitutional theory as one of the problems of um, of, in a sense, a pure system of parliamentary sovereignty, and yet, of course, the costs of it, uh, you know, create their own uh, debates. Um, but it does seem to me to be um, a, a legitimate reason for recognizing the role of the courts in this area. And it's one of the reasons, um, you know, why we would endorse a, a system such as the Human Rights Act. And in many ways, it seems to me the Human Rights Act strikes a particularly sort of thoughtful balance between the problems of political and legal accountability by through the, the mechanism of Section 4 in particular and referring uh, an issue that does seem to, to the courts to be a provision of an act that does seem to the courts to be in, um, in, contra in, in contravention of the, of, of the principle of the rights in the, in the Human Rights Act to back to Parliament for it to think about. And we know that the practice has been that Parliament has on almost every occasion taken that very seriously and sought to correct the situation. And that seems to me to reflect exactly how political and legal accountability can actually work together and not be seen as polar opposites or in tension with one another. Um, it also brings back just to the point about parliamentary scrutiny, I think, and perhaps this is my judicial background, one of the difficulties I think for parliamentary scrutiny is that legislation often has unintended consequences. It's just uh, impossible to foresee every possible working out of a complex piece of legislation which may run to several hundred provisions. And one of the things that courts see all the time is exactly those kind of unintended consequences, which with the best will in the world, a busy parliament cannot possibly hope to do. And, and I think that's another reason why quite often when you see that something is found to be problematic under the Human Rights Act and referred back to parliament, parliament's response is probably we didn't foresee that, we didn't intend that, we did not want that uh, contra human rights response, and of course we'll fix it. But only relying on parliamentary scrutiny is asking for, I think, a um, sort of 360, 2020 vision, which is just beyond any parliament. And that is one of the things courts do. They do deal with those cases where in some tiny provision has, has caused some sort of difficulty, uh, which that particular person or group of people can come to court to complain about, and which parliament, if it had known about it, probably would have addressed. I call this the kind of cleaning up function of judicial review. <laughs> Thank you. It looked as, a, as an important principle. Thank you. Joshua. I've never subscribed to the argument that uh, governments don't have legitimacy if they don't have a majority of the popular vote. Uh, we have our system in the United Kingdom, um, and I think it works pretty well. Um, you only have to compare it with democracies like Israel to see 
how did our system of proportional representation uh, can go wrong, four elections, possibly even a fifth if the current coalition uh, falls apart. The first prime minister of Israel, David Ben-Gurion, greatly regretted that he never went for the British uh, constituency system uh, in Israel, which, uh, although it's not perfect, does tend to produce strong governments. And it is appropriate that there should be strong governments provided uh, that they change from time to time and you have uh, uh, you don't have any party in power for too long, which we've achieved, broadly speaking, in the United Kingdom uh, post-war. So I think our system works well. As far as Paul Evans is concerned um, and his concerns about um, how well uh, the uh, House of Commons deserves the respect of the courts for its choices and decisions, there is the concern uh, that we were talking about earlier uh, that to some extent the executive can push through its legislation, but you only have to look at the recent Overseas Operations Service Personnel and Veterans Act to see legislation which was amended significantly by the House of Lords in its final minutes before Parliament because the government had to make concessions, sensible concessions, in order to get the legislation through. So the House of Lords does have a significant role, uh, and it also has a role, as does the House of Commons, in holding ministers to account in select committees. I think both houses do that rather well. In the House of Lords, you sometimes get the impression that peers are reading out questions written for them, which they don't necessarily understand, but they are written for them by very bright officials in uh, the committees and they are very good questions uh, and the ministers do their best to answer them. So I think that given all the circumstances and the need for a compromise, I think the system works pretty well. Of course, it could be improved, but I can't see any very obvious improvements myself at the moment. Thank you. Um, Alan, um, do you want to bring the next batch of questions? Yeah, thank you. I'm hoping we can get in two further rounds because there are so many good questions. So uh, short responses will be great if possible. So um, firstly, a question from Arabella Lang, who's from the Public Law Project. She says, Kate's reasons for constitutions being in flux all point to treaties as a vital constitutional area to address. And the need for compliance with international law is, of course, an aspect of the rule of law. Yet there is still little parliamentary or judicial accountability for treaty actions and little academic engagement in the UK. How justified do you think the government is in maintaining the position that treaties are largely non-justiciable and do not require parliamentary assent? Then we have Murray Hunt uh, from the Bingham Centre on the Rule of Law, uh, who asks, do the panel agree that the terms of our constitutional discourse have been distorted by obsessing about who has ultimate authority to decide hypothetical questions unlikely ever to arise? Isn't the more pressing question working out how the different branches respect the roles of the other branches in fulfilling their shared responsibility for the rule of law? And finally, in this round, a question, much shorter question from Tom Brake, uh, former Lib Dem MP, of course, now the director of Unlock Democracy, who asks, should a person on the Clapham omnibus be worried about what is known about government plans for judicial review? And if so, how would you explain why in lay <laughs> terms? Very good for the non-lawyers, uh, um, uh, among whom I am one, uh, who are here this morning. In which, because I would like some speedy answers, if I may, because I would like to get some more questions in. Joshua, I think it's one for you, um, given that you are so good at translating big legal issues to the general public. Should the man or woman on the Clapham Omnibus be worried about reforms to judicial review? He or she shouldn't be worried about what is currently known about the government's plans for judicial review, but uh, he or she should be very worried about the unknowns. What is currently proposed um, is, as I've said, to overturn CART, um, which is one of the, um, uh, which means that this will limit uh, judicial review uh, as well. Um, and the other proposal would allow um, a, a greater remedies um, for uh, the judges. Um, so, for example, uh, to take the Unison case about employment tribunals, uh, they wouldn't have had to uh, say that uh, all decisions are void and everybody has to have their fee returned. They could say that uh, we'll put it right for the future and um, uh, we will proceed in the future, but what's past is past and let's get it right from now onwards, there'll be no more fees. Uh, 
Now, as Edward Folks made very, very clear to the Human Rights uh, Joint Committee on Human Rights yesterday, there is a great difference between giving the judges a discretion, which he recommends and he supports, and I agree with, and setting up some sort of presumption or even compulsion that remedies in judicial review should be prospective only, which means in simple language that people who have not been able to establish their rights won't get any compensation. That would be entirely wrong in almost all cases. And what Edward says and what I say and what we're waiting to hear from the government whether it is prepared to say is this a very important question. Is it simply offering the government powers or is it as it proposed in its consultation going further than what Edward and his committee proposed trying to uh, create some sort of expectation or presumption or even requirement? If the latter, that would be very wrong. If the former, I think that would be acceptable. Thank you. Kate, could I ask you the question, Arabella Lang's question about uh, treaties? Yes, and Arabella is right. Um, in, a, in a global world in which uh, the economies and well-being of people in Britain, but people everywhere depend in a sense on how that global economy and trade works, then treaties are very important to the well-being of everybody in Britain. And having uh, a system whereby there is relatively little parliamentary scrutiny of those treaties seems to be at odds with the notion that parliament is actually the core um, democratic institution of the British constitution. So I agree with Arabella looking at the way in which treaties are made and their contents of their treaties is something that you would ex expect that parliament should have much clo closer oversight on given the impact they have on people in Britain on a daily basis. Thank you. And Edward, um, we, myself included, have spent too long obsessing about extreme cases that will never happen, the ab total abolition of judicial review, the killing of the firstborn. Shouldn't we get on with others thinking about more practical matters? No, this is the Murray Hunt question. Yeah. Murray, Murray, yes. Um, no, I think you should be you should be testing out the uh, the arguments by postulating extremes and and then um, considering what might happen. But I think Murray is essentially right. Um, we shouldn't be um, we shouldn't be spending in practical terms too much time thinking about uh, ultimate authority. I don't think it's likely to arise, but it's always helpful to think of um, hypotheses where there might be some sort of clash of power, and um, that's what we uh, we'll gain benefit from academic writings um, in enabling us to do that. Thank you, and thank you for those excellent questions, um, Alan. Uh, thank you, Catherine, for the efficient chairing in getting us to a, a th further round. Uh, two really big and quite uh, related questions uh, to finish us off. One is from Vince Pesco from the University of Huddersfield, who asks, given that piecemeal constitutional change that has no cross-party and public consensus is unlikely to be a successful long term, as many parliamentary committee reports have made clear, why do you think governments ignore that fact and refuse to do joined up constitutional change? And more importantly, is it time to entrench such changes to achieve proper consensus? And also fairly similarly, Stuart White uh, from the University of Oxford um, uh, says, I have a big background question, which perhaps relates to the theme of the constitution being in flux. One underlying issue in this discussion seems to be whether and how far judicial review should encompass some kind of substantive ethical, uh, e.g. rights-based evaluation of laws and policies. But judicial review in this sense arguably lacks democratic legitimacy unless it is based on a codified constitution that itself is a product of a political process that embodies popular sovereignty. In this respect, does the aspiration to substantive judicial review that some have in the UK implicitly push beyond the boundaries of the UK's traditional constitution? Thank you. Is there going to be a third one? Oh. Uh, just those two. Uh, I think I think those those are two really big questions about the the whole constitution that I thought it would be good to focus on. Yep, they, those are those are those are uh, me meaty questions. Um, I'll start with Kate. Did you want to particularly pick up on the um, well, I suppose the first and indeed the second about piece, piecemeal constitutional change? 
Well, it, it does seem to me that one of the hallmarks of the British constitution is that everything looks like piecemeal change, even when it can be quite sweeping change. Um, obviously, I come from a background in a, a society in which we have seen a process of fundamental constitutional change and uh, in South Africa. And I, I do think that if there is a lot to be said for the process of constitution making in terms of deepening and understanding what the nature of the political community is about and what its values are. And that you know, goes to the point um, ab about the substantive values of the British constitution. However, when it is right to make that, to have that kind of process seems to me to be a deeply political question um, and, and then also how to go about doing it. Um, so, so it was very obvious at the end of apartheid that that needed to happen. It was, was in one sense, a great constitutional political moment. It's a much more difficult question whether such a moment is likely to arrive in Britain or has arrived in Britain. And I think that uh, that need that do you need such a moment because you need the appetite for it from the political community. And do you want to say anything about um, uh, whether you should have a, a human rights review um, as part of a judicial review? Um, again, I mean, I think that these are questions which are deeply rooted in political and legal culture in particular societies. It is noticeable, I think, that in many constitutions around the world, the use of constitutional review uh, is relatively uncontroversial. The idea that courts uh, do have the power to uh, review uh, uh, legislation for constitution compliance with human rights is not controversial. It's an interesting political question why it is so controversial in the UK and the US and arguably Australia and New Zealand. It's considerably less controversial in other places. I think one really needs to understand that and the questions around political culture to be able to answer that question. I don't think there's a one size fits all solution to constitution making or constitution design. Thank you. Um, Edward. Um, yes, I mean, piecemeal reform doesn't sound on its face very attractive, but um, our constitution has evolved over a long period. And as Kate um, rightly says, it, it is in a state of flux as are many other constitutions. Uh, some of the piecemeal changes that have been made, I think have been unsatisfactory. And, and I do take the point, for example, about the, uh, the abolition of the Lord Chancellor by press release. Um, that doesn't seem to be a good way to make changes. Uh, whether you think the Lord Chancellor's role uh, should be changed is a different matter. There is quite a good argument, but that's not a way to do it. On the other hand, I'm, I do understand why the government doesn't say, right, let's get some great experts to sit down with a blank sheet of paper and start again. I think about 10 years later, they might come up with an, um, a solution. Uh, that's the problem. Uh, and um, the, uh, for example, even in our re judicial review inquiry, I looked at previous attempts and all souls had taken 10 years without coming to any very clear conclusions. These things are very difficult. There are not neat answers. Although um, what Kate says is sometimes the process of discussing a constitution can help as it were to generate good ideas. So to that extent, it is a good idea. But governments have limited, um, have limited time in which to do reforms. I think that's one of the reasons for the relative hurry with this. Uh, you've only got a couple of years, as it were, before you start thinking about elections and the like. If you've got a majority and you want to make constitutional change, you have to deal with the realities of that the parliamentary timetable, uh, hence the, um, the getting on with it. But as um, Joshua pointed out, and I've, I've said, I think the um, tackling judicial review, for example, and the absence of any reforms in the uh, Human Rights Act is going to be rather artificial, because, of course, it's a duty of the courts to, um, to review administrative action in accordance with the Human Rights Act. So you can, you can make some changes in judicial review, but it's not gonna make any difference to that. So I think there should be some joined up approach in that respect. Um, so um, there were some extremely profound uh, comments about the nature of constitutions. I mean, we have the American constitution where the position, for example, of the Supreme Court is relatively clear. There are still questions always are these the political questions, the political questions theory, for example. And then, of course, there's always been a battle between the executive and the Supreme Court there. Looking back to uh, the Roosevelt's, there was always a uh, feeling that um, the courts were going too far. And then, of course, we have the business of packing the Supreme Court with liberal versus conservative. It, I'm not sure that a perfect written constitution exists, although the South African, um, the South African achievement is remarkable and, and very interesting. 
Um, thank you. Um, Joshua, time for a written constitution. Could we do it in two years? <laughs> um, it's worth pointing out to begin with that Tony Blair's press release of the 12th of June 2003 uh, didn't abolish the Lord Chancellor. Uh, Lord Faulkner discovered that there were all sorts of hundreds of responsibilities the Lord Chancellor had and it was thought uh, much easier to uh, create two posts, uh, one Lord Chancellor, one Secretary of State, uh, and keep the Lord Chancellor and, and, and uh, 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 these things are much harder. Um, I'm, not, I'm not against codified constitutions, but I'm totally against the idea of trying to codify the Constitution of the United Kingdom as it now stands uh, for the reasons that Edward rightly gives. It would take a very long time and achieve nothing. Why uh, the, the, the government uh, said it was going to have one single uh, review of the Constitution or these constitutional issues in its manifesto, uh, we don't know. Um, we don't quite know who writes the manifesto and on what authority. You can see why Robert Buckland uh, uh, decided against the idea or somebody else persuaded him against the idea uh, because you know, that uh, constitutional committee would still be sitting. Edward Folks um, moved very quickly. Um, the, the, the review of human rights is moving pretty quickly. Um, and there is at least um, the possibility of some legislation in the current parliament. Uh, so if you try and do things together, well, maybe it doesn't quite work. But I do agree that uh, uh, reforming things in the piecemeal manner, which the government, government is currently planning to do, uh, does risk things going wrong. And, and maybe the courts will have to sort it all out. So good news for lawyers that there will be plenty of time for things for lawyers to discuss about sorting out problems. Um, I wanted to thank all three of you enormously for your time, for your insights and for your um, enthusiastic engagement. Thank you also to Alan for um, uh, sorting out the questions. Um, I want to bring this session to a close. <clears throat> I want to remind you that there's a 15 minute coffee break. Um, I'm told that uh, you can just stay on this link um, and go away, physically get your coffee and then come back. And the next session is on the uh, fascinating subject of the Fixed Term Parliaments Act, um, incredibly live issue. So I urge you to um, equip yourself with caffeine and return. But thank you hugely uh, to Edward, Joshua and Kate. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>